Thank you. Um, it's a good day. Uh, let's read the scripture. If you open your Bibles to John chapter 13, verses 21 to 38. And you guys forgive me. I set up a guitar and the song, and I didn't get my Bible out. I know it. I know it. Um. Is anybody else in the NIV? I'm in the NIV this morning. Um, if you're willing to help me out, read the first couple of verses and then I'll jump in. Chapter 13, starting at verse 21, Pastor. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one he means. Mm -hmm. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, what you are about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival, or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was not. I'll get it from here. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified. And God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you. I'm going to say that again. A new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you... Really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, God is good to us, and uh, he's preserved this word for us. And that's um, incredible. I've been scheduled for a while to teach what was last week. Uh, so I have prepared more, and I've had to distill it down a little bit because I'm uh, sharing the time this week. Um, but I have been scheduled for a while to teach on the verses that cover Jesus revealing Judas as the betrayer, the new commandment of love, and Peter's exchange that follows with Jesus. Uh, so I've titled today's teaching, or at least the first half, Judas and Love, and also Peter has hoof and mouth disease. Uh, what a combination. Thank you, Pastor Barbie. Uh, this week, uh, I'm not exactly the greatest public speaker. Uh, my history on stage is, uh, is twofold. One, uh, with scripted material and working within the scripts and within the dialogue and finding the truth of the story that needs to be told that, that involves me and becoming a character, so to speak, on stage. Uh, on the other hand, my other, uh, my other stage experience is as a worshiper. Uh, so I have plenty of experience uh, of things either prepared or off the cuff 
off the cuff, meaning I feel like the Holy Spirit's given me something to say. Uh, but other than that, the music is, is uh, lyrically it is prepared and musically it is written and there's a lot of work that goes on beforehand to get to that point. So it was not foreign for me to spend time and effort in preparing something for today. But I'm not exactly a, a, a public speaker. And this week I was a guest lecturer for the fourth grade class of Lancaster Christian Academy. I think it's appropriate that that happened this week. I was kind of a big deal. Uh, they combined fo both fourth grade classes for this convocation. Uh, it was something. I'll be honest, uh, even though I'm not a teacher, uh, I'm reminded in college, uh, I took a music history course, and I gave a five-minute presentation about a composer that I referred to as Richard Wagner. Yeah, yeah, I did that. Two presentations later, somebody else had the same, uh, <laughs> had the same, a similar presentation, and she looked right at me and referred to him as Richard Wagner. <laughs> and I was like, touche, little miss A student. Anyway, so Chelsea, Chelsea Smith gets to follow me today. Everything I do today is a setup for Chelsea. And no matter lo how long I go, uh, if she goes over, it's her fault. But even though I, I, I might have a different style than some of the other uh, teachers, uh, I actually hope you walk away intrigued and interested and in, that you want to dig in further in some way. Um, there are times when I do really feel like that I'm better at asking and creating questions than finding the answers. And I think that's okay. So you'll notice on, on whatever the sheet is, if you like writing it down, great. If you don't, I don't know how much of a help it is to you. But if you want to take those questions and go home and think about them, and actually think about them, and actually dig in for yourself, then I think I've done what the Lord's asked me to do today. Um, so number one, I encourage you to seek the Scriptures and pray through some of the things that I raise over the next half hour. So first we'll cover, uh, take a little bit of time and cover Judas. Okay, I'm going to try to fly through this. Um, why Judas? Why Judas? Why did Jesus pick Judas as a disciple if he presumably knew of the forthcoming betrayal? And I say presumably because there's plenty of uh, material in the Scripture that shows that Jesus knew He was going to be betrayed by one of the twelve. And uh, you, must, you must assume, I assume, uh, that He knew it was Judas, especially considering the conversations they had between each other uh, later. For how long did Jesus know Judas was the betrayer? Uh, did, did Jesus know when He was a teenager? I think about these things. You know, when He's learning the trade of being a carpenter and <coughs> and when he's um, spending time with the rabbis and learning scriptures and uh, presumably uh, growing as a as a as the human part 100% man 100% god uh, try to make the math work we just have to we just have to ponder it um how long did Jesus know Judas was the betrayer? Was it from the moment that he saw Judas and he still called him to be one of his disciples? Or was it before? What do we know about Judas? Um, other than the fact that uh, quite often in the, in the artist depictions over the past thousands of years, that he looks like he's half a uh, demon. Um, he was the only disciple who was not from Galilee. Um, this made him an outsider to the rest of the eleven. But he had to have had a reputation, and we'll get there for a second. Uh, for a visual, uh, Galilee up here, 
uh, Judea down here. There's some people that believe he was over in this area, uh, over, over here, but most likely Judean. And, um, and that's not an overnight trip here from, you know, that's a, that's a journey. The 11 likely either knew of each other, and many of them were close and even brothers. Um, they were friends before their lives with Jesus. Um, Judas was the outsider. And if you want to know how many miles it is or how long it takes to travel by foot from Judea to Galilee, Keith's in the back. <clears throat> the root name of Judas is Judah. And uh, Judas was often used for Judah, like we do Jack for John or Will for William. Um, he was possibly named Judas because of Judas Maccabees from the Maccabean Revolt just, I don't know, 190, 200 years before this time. I have, uh, you know, I've been writing, reading the Bible every day for a long time. Uh, I'm not saying that because I'm super spiritual. It's just because I've been doing it a long time. But I have not ever read that much of the Apocrypha. I have read a little bit. If you have any questions about the Maccabean Revolt, Ronnie's here. You can see him after. He, uh, he left his line of work and his entire life to follow Jesus just like the other disciples. He left his trade. He gave up what he had to follow Jesus. Did he perhaps carry an internal zealous attitude politically? Was he a zealot? We don't know this. But his, uh, his name can give clues toward that. Um, but not unlike many of the uh, many subversive anti-occupation freedom fighters that were in that area. Judas was the money man. He was the business leader of the group. He was in charge of the bag. It probably means he was the most trusted of character or education. Think about that. If he was chosen, if Matthew would have been the obvious, he's going to be the one who's going to be tempted to take from, we need, we need to choose the one who's the most trustworthy to hold the bag. And Judas was chosen. I think that's a big, I think that's a big thing. Think about it like this. He was the one in the group that might have been considered the business leader of the twelve. Judas was a thief. We know that... Uh, Perhaps he was a kleptomaniac. Maybe it's something that he fell into once he became part of the bag. Maybe it was something that was with him his whole life. We don't know that, but we do know he was a thief. All the Gospels uh, were written after Jesus was resurrected and ascended to heaven. And so they certainly knew he was a thief by then. And so he's listed as a thief quite often. And he's always listed last. With hindsight being 2020, if I had been writing an account, I would have listed him last as well. Now, think about how today this would be a highly educated, highly trustworthy on the surface, a guy who gets the really good corporate job. Or when all the resumes are sent in to the, to the big burgeoning 2,000 member church, the one that sticks out and, and gets pulled and maybe hired for the big church. He didn't do any favors for his name. I was talking about this with Keith this morning. There's a scholar that had written how there's evidence where others that were named Judah who were going by Judas stopped going by Judas after the betrayal and chose to go by Judah or Jude. Um, goodness, if you thought Aaron Burr was a rough one, plenty... Plenty of Aaron's are still being born. You don't find very many toddlers named Judas. Maybe the threshold for the worst humans in history coincides with their first names dying off following their infamous lives. There is... Uh, this is another painting of uh, the Last Supper. This one is also called the Last Supper. It predates Da Vinci's Last Supper by 150 years. I've seen this painting in person at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. 
This is uh, tempera, uh, which is a fast drying paint as opposed to oil, and, uh, and gold, that's actually gold, on wood from uh, between circa 1325 and, and 20, Ugolino da Siena. It's the only piece I know of his. But. Um, it's interesting to me that it seems through the Scriptures that the Passion Week leading up to Jesus' crucifixion, death, and resurrection was the most difficult thing that Jesus had to endure and go through. All, all of those, it's one thing after another. Maybe the greatest challenge was Jesus knowing what had to happen. Um, and many of our Lord's quotes throughout the Gospels uh, show us that the timing of everything was necessary. So I think about the timing of this because uh, I'm compelled to just kind of think about and chew on, if you will, like a cud, that the very thing that Jesus covers as soon as He sends Judas away is this new commandment of love. And why did He call it new there? I mean, look at, look at His teachings all through the Gospels. <coughs> Excuse me. There's, there is... So many scriptures that refer to uh, love and how love is the greatest commandment and, uh, and, and, and all of those things uh, throughout the Gospels. And then, he, and then here he says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. And that's, uh, that's powerful. So we're going to think about that a little bit more. I, uh, I've, I'm trying to been, be flying because I'm supposed to give Chelsea so much time. But... Uh, Forgive me, I, I don't think I've given all your numbers, have I? We can fly through them uh, for a second because I need to get... I'm at number five. So what number do you not have? <coughs> Are you at number five? Okay, yay. Okay, number five. Jesus washes Judas's feet. That's the setup to this scene. That's what happens right before this, <clears throat> this moment with Judas. Um... I find that an incredible act of love. Think about that. Jesus offers him the bread and the body. And uh, I'm not going to get into the weeds about, you know, um, of this being his portion of the Last Supper or whether or not it was just, here's, here's, here's our betrayer here, everybody. And then, of course, Jesus sends Judas to do it away and do it right now. Um, Pastor Allen, would you read for me in, this, in uh, verses 27, 28, and 29? I want to hear that again. And after the morsel of Satan then entered him, Jesus therefore said to him, What you do, do quickly. Now, no one of those reclining at the table knew for what purpose he had said this. For some were supposing because Judas had the money box, that Jesus was saying to him, Buy the things you have need for the feast, or else that he should give something to the poor. I also find it interesting that Jesus told him to do what you're going to do quickly. After telling everyone in the upper room that He's going to let them know which of them is the betrayer, and they still did not even realize what He meant when He said, go and do it quickly. Jesus says to everybody, I'm going to say who the, you know, one of you is the betrayer, and they all, they all respond, is it I? Eleven of them say, is it I, Lord? And one of them says, and we, we hear from, uh, I believe it's Matthew, one of them being Judas says, is it I, Rabbi? Does, is that telling or not? I don't know, but I think it's interesting that he's the only one who, used, he still, who said, still said teacher instead of my Lord. Um, the level of trust for Judas must have been so high that they did not expect those words from Jesus to Judas, to mean to go ahead, betray Him right now, even though for us it seems obvious. It's also interesting to me in this account of John's that each of the eleven said, Lord, who, who is it? Including John, the author. And, and they were all carrying this posture. 
that even though they could not imagine themselves abandoning this cause and betraying their Savior, they were still aware of their own weaknesses. They realized that they were capable of being the one to betray their Lord. There's a line in an Andrew Peterson song that says, what about the times when even followers get lost? I wonder what it would do to us if we carried that posture that we could make a choice that could betray our Lord. Is it me, Lord? Paul teaches often about a daily re-examination of our hearts. Turning from the flesh to the Spirit. Taking up our cross daily. That in our weakness, He is strong. We often... <clears throat> y'all forgive me. <coughs> We often teach about the great importance of reading Scripture and praying daily and having this devotional time with our Lord. And that's the most meaningful part of your day. I think the more I think about Judas from what we know of the canonical Gospels, and I, I would just simply, when it comes to Judas, ignore the what's not canon. I would stay in your Scriptures. But the more I'm saddened, by the whole scene. Number six, was it greed? There's evidence that greed had something to do with it. Maybe more accurately, the ongoing greed of carrying the bag, feeling important, finding himself feeling the rush of a steady, bit by bit, stealing from those funds that he's getting away with. Then Jesus admonished him in front of the others by saying something negative about the woman who broke the perfume bottle and poured it over and anointed him his feet. And perhaps this admonition from Jesus caused a rage in him internally that sent him down a different path. Have you ever been corrected or admonished in front of others and felt hurt and angry? Guilty or not, I have. I was guilty. And it hurt. And at that point, you have a choice. You can respond in humility or you can allow pride to grab you. Was it envy? Number seven. It appears to me that envy could have had something to do with it. If, if Judas was the most trustworthy of the disciples, or at least his reputation was that way, because we know he was a thief, is there a chance that he felt like Jesus was getting all the praise and that he felt like he should have some for himself? Did he feel... Did he start to feel like he should be more important than, than he was? Did um, having been given the power to cast out demons and heal the sick go to his head? Think about it. He was one of the twelve. He was given that power. Did part of him deeply believe in his rabbinical leadership so much that when Jesus became politically dangerous to them, was Judas conflicted? Did he have a desire to be right on both sides? Have you ever had a desire to, to want to be right on both sides of something? I've been accused of playing both sides for something. But uh, that's, a, that's a dangerous place to be when you're trying to... Uh, find approval on all sides of something. It seems to me that he had some confliction within him. Uh, talking to Keith earlier today, when, I'm not going to go into it, but um, is there a chance that Judas betrayed Jesus to try to show the world what, what Jesus could do when it's put in that situation that Jesus would bring the revolution at that time? Was that possible? You could suppose through the Scriptures that Judas, although called to be a disciple by Jesus, that he never became a believer in Jesus as Lord. It might be true. And, and there are many pastors that preach this, and I'm not so sure. I, I'm not here to give you answers. But if that was so, if he was not a believer, no matter how much he might have loved his friends, as an unbeliever in Jesus and a believer in his Jewish faith and the Jewish leadership, he might have felt 
that he wanted to end up on the right side of history. And of course, the great irony of that is he became the most infamous character in ending up on the wrong side of history. But suppose with me that Judas was sincere when he made his commitment to follow Jesus as his rabbi, but carried a double-minded struggle, struggle at times. Um, in Luke 9, uh, Jesus gives the twelve disciples the power over sickness and disease and demonic powers. And I don't believe that's a small deal. And Judas, number eight, Luke 9 includes Judas. Matthew 7, 22, Judas is there when Jesus says this. And uh, I'm going off of memory. Ronnie, help me. But it's, um, you know, some of you are going to, you know, there's going to be plenty of you that say, Lord, Lord, I cast out demons in your name. And he'll say, I never knew you. Something like that. Is that close? That's a, that's a super uh, will version. Uh, one form of mental struggle that we have is, as human beings is, is referred to as intellectual dissonance. And intellectual dissonance is, an, is both a genuine commitment and an honest disbelief. And that struggle. And sometimes we call that, as Christians, doubt. And all Christians at times have a struggle with doubt. And Bible scholars, of which I am surely not, though I'm intrigued by their studies, have debated about whether or not God's plan required this betrayer from the twelve just in this way. And it does say, once Jesus gives Judas the bread, it says Satan entered in him. Does that mean that Judas lost his free will at that point. I don't think so if you look at his actions later. Does that mean Judas had rejected Jesus at that point and by rejecting Jesus, it made him vulnerable internally to this possession? Now, if you want to know these answers, obviously I've made lots of jokes about reaching out to other people. I, I'm not here with answers, I'm here with questions. And I think the big disclaimer here is that some of this is opinion and I hope you'll think about it ponder on these things. Uh, if Judas had not betrayed Jesus and stayed true, if he had repented of his thievery, do you think God would have found another way for Jesus to be captured, unjustly tried and crucified and still leading to our redemption through His death, burial, and resurrection? I'm not sure I know, and we don't know because that's not how it happened. But the biggest thing out of this for me, and I think it's the through line. I'm so sorry, darling. You okay? And I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up. I, I only have seven slides left, and I'll, I'll, I'll push it like this. So go. Thank you. Thank you. So the, uh, thank you, Pastor Barbie. Uh, go, going from... Jesus taking off his outer cloak and robe and putting a towel around him and having a basin and getting down on his knees and, and washing the feet of each one of the disciples and, and washing Judas's feet, knowing in the, ne the very next few moments he's going to be revealing him as the great betrayer and, uh, and knowing where he's going with the, with the 11 that are left after Judas leaves and to tell them, look, it, if you if you if you have a takeaway, it's all over. After you know, it's he's trying to tell them, look, I'm going and you can't go. But if if there's a takeaway here, love each other. And what greater example of love than how Jesus loved Judas through the whole process? He loved Judas. I'm not saying he went through the motions. I'm not saying he did the right thing. He gave him a chance. He loved him. Though God is all-knowing. And, and there are things that Jesus even said in the Scriptures that he didn't necessarily know in his earthly ministry, like when, when, when he was coming back and all, all of that. We can get into that later. But the, 
this is, this is not one of them. There's all that evidence through the Gospels that Jesus knew that He was the impending betrayer. It's a mind-blowing thought to think about how Jesus still loved Him. And I, I'm going to stop with Jesus here, and Pastor Jonathan in a few weeks is going to come back in with the rest of the Judas story. And I'm sure he'll have lots of gems for us. But until then, let's do a little bit of review to make a point to get to uh, God's love and also, also Peter's hoof and mouth disease. So, uh, he carried the bag and stole from it. He was critical of any waste funds or assumed reasons, for the assumed reasons of ongoing thievery. He's outed by Jesus in front of the disciples. He goes and negotiates the betrayal for 30 pieces of silver, and we know all about all that that's coming later, okay? A new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so that you must love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples. By that love for each other. <clears throat> I think if, if today someone is referred to as a Judas, they're a trusted friend, a leader, a confidant, certainly one who has appeared to support a cause, who instead has subversively undermined the vision of a leader or a church and betraying that trust and the efforts to destroy the cause from within. It's a harsh accusation. And it seems unfathomable for us, kind of like where the disciples were when they were saying, whoa, one of us? But perhaps it's not. I'm not saying that I'm sympathetic to Judas at all, but his story breaks my heart. Might I suggest that we take the posture of our self-reflection, that each of us as disciples, and if you're in this room, you're digging in for more. Is it I, Lord? What choices have I made or what choices will I make that could betray you? I once played Judas on stage when I was in college. I was daunted by the challenge. I changed my hair. You can ask her about it. I, uh, I got an earring for a short while that got infected and had to, be, had to be removed by a doctor. I tried to disguise my appearance. But the more I studied about the character of Judas, the more I asked the questions about becoming this person on stage and this person that would do such a terrible thing, I realized that he was a man. I realized that I am just a man. I thought about how close we actually are. And only by the grace of God am I redeemed for my despicable actions. And can I keep that on my heart? Could it be me, Lord? May we humble ourselves in such a way that we realize that without daily examination, daily self-sacrifice, that we too could be swayed by that enemy. After this commitment to love each other, no matter who might be against us, Peter sticks his foot in his mouth again. He, he has a knack for it. He, uh, and Jesus has to let him know he's not as strong as he thinks he is. And that goes right along with, is it I, Lord? In our weakness, Christ is strong. May we daily humble ourselves to glorify God, to take up our cross, admit our weaknesses and our failures, for none of us have arrived. May we submit to God in order that we, number nine, love one another. You don't need a computer, do you?
well, we're going to pick up right where we left off. <laughs> and I told him when he told me, he was like, listen, if we go over, it's your fault, not mine. I'm okay with that. <laughs> no, I don't think that we will. Um, so we're going to be in uh, John 14, 1 through 15, if somebody wants to read that. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. You know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long? And you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on the of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go back to uh, verses 1 through 4, and this is um, this passage is Jesus offering solace to his disciples and comforting them as he is preparing to leave them. And I don't know about you, but if somebody told me they were leaving and then didn't tell me where they were going, and they're like, you can't come with me, <laughs> and you loved them and you had respect for them, I don't know that I would handle it that well. <laughs> I know I don't handle it that well, um, but in this, Jesus um, comforts his disciples, and he comforts us in our times of uncertainty and fear. Like a trustworthy guide, Jesus assures us that he is always with us, guiding us through life's challenges towards our ultimate destination, which is the presence of God. Um, as a lot of you guys know, I feel like I never stop talking about this, which people make jokes about it, because when I told them I was going to go on the world race, they're like, you're going to talk about this for the rest of your life, and they're right. Um, but going back to it, I had gotten on this boat in Guatemala, and I do not like water. <laughs> I will swim in a swimming pool. Um, I still get a little freaked out by, like, community swimming pools. It's just, I can't. So they're like, we're going to go on this boat, and we're going to go across this lake, and when you think of a boat here, it is not the kind of boat that you <laughs> would get on in a foreign country. And there's like cracks at the top of it in the wood that I'm like, y'all know how boats work, right? <laughs> if water gets in that, I don't, I don't know about this. So I'm freaking out the whole time. And this guy is our guide. I obviously have no relationship with him. And he's talking in a foreign language. He doesn't speak English. And I'm like, we're really getting in this boat. And we're trusting this guy. Like, Nobody knows where we're going. What's the point of us getting on this boat? <laughs> I'm freaking out, and all my friends are like, Chelsea, you need to calm down. He's done this a thousand times. He's no, he knows what he's doing, all this stuff. And the, guy, the guide had a friend with him, and they're like chit-chatting the whole time and having a good old time. And everybody else around me is like trusting these people, which, again, I'm like, <laughs> there's cracks in the boat, y'all. So we get out on the lake, and... Um, the moral of that story is just the fact that I simply did not have a relationship with the guide, so therefore I'm not going to trust him to lead me. So in this, if he is our guide and he is the, the disciple's guide in the sense of 
why can't you just trust him to lead you to that next point? Um, so in, we'll fly through this real quick, hold on. Uh, verses five through seven. Let's go there. It says, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Um, yeah, seven. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. Thomas expresses doubt and confusion, much like we may sometimes in our faith journey. Again, I know I do. I did in that situation. And ultimately, I realized it wasn't that I wasn't trusting the guide. I wasn't trusting the Lord to get me <laughs> through there. Like, obviously, he's put the guide in that moment for us to learn how to trust him in the situations that we walk through. Um, John 8 through 11, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. He says that, and I have asked the Lord to show himself to me but is that enough for us sometimes? I feel like we're always just wanting more from him. I mean, he, we don't deserve more, but he loves us enough to give us more. Um, so I found that interesting that he says that that would be enough. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I also, <laughs> I love how sassy Jesus can be sometimes. Is that appropriate for me to say? Don't you know me? Like, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time, and when he asks this, I can only think that Jesus is, like, disappointed in a way. Like, man, how long have we been walking together? How many miracles have you seen me do? How many times have you seen me come through for you? Or whatever it may be that you still aren't getting it. It's like Jesus just wants you to understand. Like, just trust me. It should just be a simple thing that you've seen me do this over and over again. Um, anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say you, the words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is my Father living in me who is doing the work. Uh, let me see. Jesus promises that those who believe in him will do even greater works and will be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Like a guide equipping travelers with necessary tools, Jesus provides us with the Holy Spirit to lead, empower, and guide us in fulfilling our purpose and mission in the world. Um, I also, in South Africa, on my trip, I am terrified of heights. I'm scared of a lot of things, apparently. But I'm terrified of heights, and I thought jumping off of a bridge would cure that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry, mom and dad. Didn't tell them that. Um, but all of my friends are like, I'm telling you, it's, it's a good way. I was saying this out loud. I'm like, wow, Josie, you just, it's a good way to really trust the Lord. <laughs> like, yeah, you're so right. So I uh, zip lined. That's how massive this bridge is. I zip lined to the middle of the bridge. Again, I'm like, it's not setting in what I'm doing. I wasn't really fearful until I was on the edge of the bridge. But I'm ziplining to the middle of the bridge. And again, I'm having to put my trust in human people to tether me correctly and like make sure I'm not thinking about this at this point. I'm like, yeah, my friend said, this is a good way to learn how to trust God. I'm like, that's a great idea. So I get up and we're like strapping ourselves in. I have... Literally, I'm not paying attention to how they're tethering me. I'm just like, yeah, I'm going to jump. And they put you to the edge of that thing. And they're like, one, two, three. And I had seen people before me, like, kind of hesitate. And they're not going to force you to do it. But they'll just keep counting. So they'll start over, one, two, three. And I'm like, no, I'm going to get to the edge of that thing. And I'm just going to go. <laughs> so I did. And I got to the edge. And I'm like, as soon as my feet left the top of that bridge, Fear. I mean, immediate panic attack. I was freaking out, screaming on the way down, and it's hilarious because there is video evidence of this, Lord, um, that has audio. And there's a friend of ours that took us to this bridge who is, like, miles away from us, from, like, where you come in to sign in, and then there's the bridge way in the distance, and you can hear me screaming the whole time, like, very clearly. It's not a faint noise at all. <laughs> it's because I didn't trust it. In a way, I feel like there's so many times in our lives that we have allowed the people around us 
to make us feel safe when ultimately I did not think at all, not once, being transparent, Lord, if this is something that really would help me trust you, I never in, my, in the process of making this decision was like, okay, Lord, I trust you, not once. Until after I was like, Jesus, I have to trust you. I'm not going to go plummeting to the ground right now. Um, but how many times in our lives do we allow all of these situations that we walk through to dictate our trust in the Lord? And um, just as the disciples, like how many times, again, did Jesus show up for them and provide for them? Or I'm sure they had friends who needed healing that Jesus touched or so many things that could have happened that isn't even recorded that Jesus is like, just get it. Like, just trust me because I have done this over and over and over and over again. Um, so when Jesus is walking alongside us, he offers us comfort, guidance, and assurance. May we trust him, follow him as the way, embrace him as the truth, and experience him as the source of abundant life. Let's go forth, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to share the love and truth of Christ in the world around us. So, Lord, thank you um, for your holy words, Lord. And I just thank you for the love that you have for us, even in the times that we have chosen um, to betray you in our actions and our words, Lord. Would you forgive us? Would we fall forth in humility to repent? Um, we, we don't take it lightly when we take you for granted, Lord. So I just ask that we would learn how to trust you as the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, would we trust you as you lead us in the way as our guider, as our comforter, as our friend, Lord, as our teacher? Would we trust that you are the truth when we're seeking for it, that you are the truth? When we find you, we find truth. And Lord, would you... Help us understand that there is abundant life through you, Jesus. Lord, you're holy, you are sovereign, and we are so grateful to be loved by a holy, sovereign God. In Jesus' name, amen.